Um, clearly, you came here to hear Jim and myself introduce Gene for about 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. So I will be take about 30 seconds um, and just emphasize um, this because to even start to go on to Jean's um, resume and the work she has done would do, do injustice to the rest of her work. I'll just say that she is a principal with Goody Clancy and one of the most important um, both practitioners of historic preservation and trying to um, and doing sustainability through historic preservation as well as um, writer and theorist on that issue. And I urge you to take a look at this book, Sustainable Preservation, which will become the Bible of the historic preservation and sustainability movement. And I just, we talked last night at dinner, and one of the most important things I think that she might be able to achieve, we agreed we're not there yet, is to bring back a merger of histor the historic preservation movement and the environmental movement, because they belong together and they will only succeed in their, their mission together. And I think this book and her work is a real step on the in the right direction. So I'm really glad we have invited her. She accepted and she will enlighten us today. Thanks. So you already got to see this, so you got to think about this. How many people brush their teeth today? Okay, if the person next to you didn't raise their hand, you can move now, that's your <laughs> chance, or give them a breath mat. But my point is, if you brushed your teeth today, or you at least knew you were supposed to brush your teeth today, then you already understand and practice stewardship. You know that, that pra brushing your teeth every day, daily maintenance, daily stewardship is going to save you the pain and the cost of the deferred maintenance from not brushing your teeth. So you understand and practice stewardship. And stewardship is really the basis of the environmental movement. Stewardship is about taking care of the whole earth, not just pieces of it, but the whole earth. It was the Sierra Club that 40 years ago started the, the mantra of reduce, reuse, recycle. And I would stress the fact that the first two things, reduce and reuse, come before recycle. Recycle is a last resort. And uh, they weren't just talking about bottles when they started this 40 years ago. They were actually talking about the re reducing the amount of resources that we use, reusing the resources that we've already started to use, and as a last resort, recycling them in order to reduce the amount of new resources we would have to use. So. I came to the preservation movement as a preservation architect in a fairly convoluted way. I was in my late 30s. I had actually been working for almost 15 years as a wilderness guide in the West, um, something my parents were really, really excited when I announced that I was actually going to get a career that was a little bit more definable, like architecture um, and preservation architecture. But I came to, to preservation architecture because I fully understood after 15 years of working in the wilderness that the only way to protect the wilderness, the only way to take care of the environment is to look at uh, the seven billion people and how we live on this earth. And I started using this slide, oh, maybe three, four months ago. And three, four months ago, I could actually, I think I first used it at the Nessie conference in March. And I could say then 6.8 billion people. Now I can say 7 billion people. So it's what, it's what we do on this planet that will define the health of the planet and define the environment. So what I do is I try to recycle the largest buildings I can find, the largest objects I can find. You know, I, I do recycle my aluminum cans. I actually try not to drink anything out of an aluminum can or out of a plastic bottle. So that's my little piece in my, I have a pretty high hypocrisy footprint because I fly around the world talking about sustainability. But as an offset to that, I try to recycle buildings. So I am look for clients, and, and the federal government has been a good one that allows me to repurpose buildings. And this is a, a 700,000 square foot building in downtown Boston. Its primary tenant is the EPA. It just went lead gold. Uh, you know, it's, it's running at about 20% less energy use Bef than it before the renovation and has actually got about 20% higher density occupancy. So it's been a good success story for the federal government and for us and a fun project. This is another federal project, about a million square feet in, in uh, Anacostia right across the river from Washington, D.C. 
it's actually, I know there's a little irony in this, it's, it's one of the most important remnants of a, a mental asylum from the 1860s up to the 1940s. It was actually the only insane asylum for our military. It's a uh, National Historic Landmark and is destined, we hope, to be the new home for Department of Homeland Security. That's the irony part. <laughs> So, but it's you know it's a million square feet that the federal government is repurposing and and recognizing the heritage value of and weaving into it their commitment, particularly the General Services Administration, to uh, actually they've now committed to going net carbon. However, you define that. Fiona probably talked about this the different ways that you could define it. But they at least seriously understand the convergence of the environmental uh, sustainability and building reuse. There was a time when it was a given that you would reuse buildings because buildings actually and objects had economic value. That it was it was more economical to repurpose a building, to move a building, to repair your toaster, to repair a window. It was it was an economic issue that made the repurposing of buildings, the relocation of buildings, and repair the mandate over replacement. That has drastically changed, and as a preservation architect, I am constantly confronted by the fact that it is less expensive to replace than to repair. That has become the standard within construction. The economic structure is about replacement, it's about best value, it's about retail value, higher purposing, more density, all of that. But what, what we know, and what the EPA study from a few years ago has shown, is that in this country, of all the materials that we use, the raw resources that we use, almost half of these go for new construction. Now, we have, this country has 5% of the world population, and we use 30% um, of the world's resources. So 15% of the world's resources go for our roads, our bridges, our buildings, all of our new infrastructure, replacement infrastructure, and new construction. So, you know, it speaks to sort of a, a moral obligation that we have, even if it weren't an environmental one, to really think about how we're using these resources and to, to use them well if we're going to use this much, uh, use them so that we don't have a cycle of replacement, but that will mean changing our economic structure or our policies in order to make that happen because we will always come up against the fact that it is less expensive to replace than the repair in almost every case, whether it's an incremental piece or a whole building. And part of the reason is that we don't Unlike our teeth, which we can't get away from and have to brush every day, you can disown a building. You can move on. You know, the average homeowner stays in their building for five years, so it's not in their best interest to keep a cycle of repair. It's not in their best interest to put a slate roof back on instead of an asphalt roof. It's okay for someone who's not going to be in a building economically to move things into a down cycle so that they're using materials that will have to be replaced sooner rather than later. They have no incentive not to. And so that becomes part of, of a policy economic change that has to be there to have a sustainable world. Because what we, we find ourselves doing as preservation architects is we're put in a position of replacing things that have great service life, like a window, um, which is actually also a fairly brilliant piece of engineering in most cases. And we're often re replacing it with something that has a shorter life cycle and probably is more toxic. And the toxicity is something that isn't fully acknowledged as we talk about environmental upgrades or energy uh, changes to buildings. Because we also know that new construction, that lump of 15% of all that we use, or 15% of the world's resources, also has the highest level of human toxicity higher even than the electrical industry, which we, everybody in this room probably knows is just evil, you know, because of coal. So if you realize that new construction actually creates more human toxicity than our current system, which is half our electricity comes from coal, it's really a little scary. And the thing that's also really scary is this is just the toxicity that we acknowledge. This is just what our country calls toxic. We don't call the fire retardants that have been required in California for 20 years and that are banned in Europe, we don't label those as toxic. 
We don't call vinyl baseboard toxic even though we know the phthalates in every uh, flexible vinyl product in very minute quantities um, you know, reduce your sperm count. And I've lately realized that if we just put vinyl baseboard everywhere, we could solve the population problem. <laughs> So it's a new strategy, you know, I just wasn't thinking holistically. Here I was trying to get rid of toxicity, but there was a solution to this that was a different way of thinking about it. So, but my point is that the toxicity factor is rarely, rarely part of the conversation, and it's huge. It's, you know, toxics, many of the toxins we create don't go away. We can clean up brownfields and Superfund sites, but it goes somewhere. It just may move from your community to another community. And the same thing is happening when we're using products because we're not really thinking about all the different components that go into products. So if you realize that every single aspect of a building, every single aspect of any product creates an environmental impact, it has to, unless you're building an adobe building in New Mexico and using mud from the site and water from the site, you, there's no way you can have any product and it's not going to have an impact. So think of it in the very simplest terms, every object, like you know that table, creates in an average, just in its waste stream, the estimate is, is 70 to 1. So we get one table, but somewhere around the world there are 70 other tables that are waste. And they're not the problem is they're really not all in one place. You know, there might be a little table in New Jersey and there's a little bit of waste in India and there's a little bit of waste in China, but the impact of that one object spreads all the way around the globe. And when you, 70 to 1 is the conservative estimate. For, for fine metals like a, a wedding ring, this might be three tons of waste. Uh, but I said that in a, in a lecture and my husband was there and he shouted from the back of the room, he said, it's okay, it's fake. <laughs> so I, I, of course, felt better that, that I had a fake wedding ring that hadn't created that impact. You know, maybe we could at least open the back things. I, I'm going to be asleep before you are at this rate if we have no daylight here. So I wrote this book, and, you know, this was really an exercise that was done mostly at night, and there was one famous vacation where there was a walk-in closet and I wrote in the walk-in closet at night. It had a plug though, that was good, it had an outlet. Um, so I didn't really expect people to read this book because I sort of wrote it in this closet in a vacuum, but I did get a lot of information and it did radicalize me because I now am, as my daughter says, I'm the queen of dire data. I'm like you know, I can just quote dire data left and right. And I do it a lot in the book. But the point of the dire data is to really, you know, understand as much as we can and then perhaps use that to mobilize and move on. So I know from the dire data that I found in this book that our cleaning industry creates 60 million pounds of chemicals uh, every year that we have our cleaning industry is actually one of the highest rates of asthma. That, so that what I can translate that to is good environmental policy and good building policy is to have materials that are easily cleaned, that don't use chemicals, that maybe don't even use a lot of water because that's also part of our environmental footprint. So if we have long service life, easily cleanable materials and easily repairable, we've done a really good thing for the environment and we've done a really good thing for our health. And we should always remember, as we're talking about sustainability, it's really about a healthy world. You know, we tend to talk about sustainability as though it's some neo-Puritan punishment that we are going to have to take shorter showers and we're not allowed to use our cars and we can't, you have to think whether it's, you know, I forgot my cloth bag, I can't remember, is paper worse than plastic, oh darn, you know. So we, we think of it as a restrictive world, but a sustainable world is really about a healthy world. It's about a world that we want to be in. It's about a world that, that rewards us for the adult behavior of being good stewards. And so it, 
it isn't a punishment. It is a change, and some of that change will be very hard. But a sustainable world is a place that we all want to move towards and that we never really reach, because sustainability is just like brushing your teeth. Sustainability is an ongoing exercise, an ongoing uh, experience, and an ongoing responsibility, which is no doubt why in my bleaker moments I believe that we have no hope. But that was another thing my husband said to me after he heard a lecture. He says, you have to offer people some hope. <laughs> so you're my hope, actually. You're my belief that if you care, and all of us care, and all of us continue to push, and continue to really look for the answers, that we will continually move towards a more sustainable world. So my part of this world is buildings. It's about buildings that already exist. How can, I'm often asked, and there's this extraordinarily ridiculous conversation that often comes up about the conflict between preservation and green. Please, I just, I, I can't bear that as a, as a paradigm. That's so ridiculous. Every building can be made greener. And every building must be made greener all the time, even if it's a brand new lead platinum building. Every building takes continual stewardship, continual monitoring, and continual reevaluation to make it as green as possible. So we can constantly do things as technologies become available, as new monitoring systems become available, as new knowledge becomes available. We can always green buildings, and we have a, we should be greening buildings. There's easily 300 billion to 400 billion square feet of existing buildings in this country. Depends on which site you go to. But clearly, greening our existing buildings is a responsibility that we should be embracing, racing towards. Now, there are very easy ways to green buildings, and uh, some of them are what they call low-hanging fruit. But just think if we did them in every single building. Just think if every single person, had, every single building had motion sensors, every single building was watching to see if their fans were running over time, every single building was turning out the lights when people left the room. These are really simple things, not to mention air sealing and, and just thinking about lighting and what's going on and how we're using energy around us. You know, not all of this is, is it's, some of this is just, it is behavioral. How do we take care of existing lands, uh, national historic landmarks? This Trinity Church, City of Boston, I was privileged to work on this building from 2000 to 2005. Now, in, in the United States, in preservation, unlike many other parts of the world, we don't rank our buildings. Ironically, a building is either historic or it's not. So it could be one of the, the 2,000 National Historic Landmarks in the country, or it could be individually listed on, uh, as a national hist uh, in the National Register, or it could be merely a contributing feature within a historic community. It's still, each one is a historic building in our system, but not to me. You know, this, this building is a National Historic Landmark. This building was H.H. H. Richardson's, put him on the map. Not his first building, but certainly the one that got attention, the one that, that drew the attention of the world, the one that's credited with actually starting the idea that there was a Richardson Romanesque, which is actually the only style of architecture named after an American architect. So, to me, Trinity Church is the epitome of an iconic building, and we, working on it, our team regarded it as though we were working on the York Minster, which is a thousand years old. This building is 125 years old. And our mandate to our team and to ourselves was that we do no harm to this building. That with any luck, if Boston isn't underwater, um, this building will be around in a thousand years and it will be a gift to future generations, and they will be looking at what we did, the little medieval people, and they probably will be somewhat forgiving, but we felt we needed to be most forgiving of ourselves. So our task in this was how to steward this building and this institution. This is a church that's been in Boston for several hundred years. It's been an integral player in the society of Boston. So our, our mandate was both about the building and about the institution of Trinity Church. 
So how can you green a building like this? Well, one of the great things about the new surge in, in green building is we have more, uh, uh, more ability to get to sometimes old technologies like ground source heat pumps, but they're becoming more economically viable, they're becoming more immediate. This system was put in in, in 2002, so it was a little early and never been done in, in Boston, and never been done on an area that has, uh, that has wood pilings so that, for those of you that are preservationists or, or building technology people, you know that a wood piling system needs to be kept underwater in order to avoid rotting. So maintaining the water levels in the back bay was extremely important. So this is a system that uses a looped, a closed looped, drills down into the ground. There's six wells, gives you about 200 tons. They're not really wells, but there's six holes. Gives you about 200 tons of cooling, and the, the wells are sealed for the first 280 feet until they get to bedrock, so they're well below the ground water. And then the, the system just uses the temperature of the earth, uh, which in our, and we have enough wells that we can rotate between them so we never uh, change the temperature of the earth. So this kind of technology is very exciting. And the best thing about this for historic buildings is it's completely outside the building envelope in the 10, in 10 feet that we had around the building, but it doesn't hurt the building. And so that's what we were looking for, is systems that were good for the building and good for the environment and good for the occupants. Now this is what we had underneath the building to work with. This is actually a laser scan. It's not a photograph. This is the, the, what the laser records as it bounces around the space and we we use laser documentation to create the documents for this building for the accuracy of it and and you get these images as a byproduct of that but from this space became the new meeting space for the church so we went below the building in an area that wasn't visible from outside to create new community spaces and we had a, a philosophy of trying to use as few materials as possible and still respect the building so we used the foundations of the building as our perimeter walls and as part of the architecture so this building was 2002 it was very early lead was never a conversation and Ironically, during the design, environmental stewardship was actually never a conversation. It was just assumed. And uh, it was only after we'd finished the project that we were asked to document um, what we believed we had done that was environmentally sustainable, which was the reduction of materials, managed waste, uh, uh, more efficient lighting, and a use of a ground source system. But what we really did is we renewed and restored this community. We gave a, a, a institution that is in the heart of the city a space that over a thousand groups a year use. And we reinvigorated that institution right before the recession. And uh, the real recession. We thought we were in a recession then, but we didn't know. So we created a place where people can, can reinforce community. And that is the other part about sustainability. I'm sure many of you know the triple bottom line that we're really, when we're talking sustainability, we're really talking about the people, about the planet, and about a prosperous, equitable world. That's what sustainability is. It's never just about the environment. And that's an important thing to remember as well. Now, Part of stewardship is addressing the fact that we are in a changing world. Historic preservation is really about managing change and uh, not about freezing things in place. And I, I believe very strongly that the United States is a little too, too prone to consider preservation an act of freezing things in place. And that is not what we should be doing. It, the world is vital, buildings are vital, uh, this is really about managing change. So this was a project in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, the groundwork for this was, was set by a fabulous master plan that was led by Dennis Swinford, who you may have heard of. And he did a brilliant job of working with the local community and the college to create an integrated plan and to get buy-in from all the key players, which was huge. So this was a building that the college had purchased two years ago and had been sitting vacant. It's a, it's a 1860s house. It's one of 11 buildings in Burlington that predates the Civil War. It had had only three owners. It was remarkably, beautifully intact. 
the, the previous owners had been in it for probably 20 years, had never even put in uh, you know, modern bathroom or, or kitchens. They'd done it all in one really tacky little wing. So the main part of the building was just exquisitely intact if run down. What the college needed in this location was this became, this was sort of the, the keystone for drawing different parts of the campus together and the vision was from the master plan that this would be the, the welcome center for new students and the place that existing students went to pay their bills and get their counseling. But the community around this was, was very, very nervous about this and certainly would have been more nervous before the master plan, but the master plan process was very integrative, worked with the community. So what we were able to do in designing the new Wilcom Center is to really set the center back behind the building, to completely restore the house, keep it as a meeting area and office space, and restore it to its original colors, uh, restore the wood windows, and uh, get a remarkably airtight enclosure actually and put the, the volume that we needed for the welcome center behind the building so that it's not visible from the residential street which is actually a historic district. So the volume behind was split so that the views from inside the house still looked out to the lake. For us, that was part of the defining characteristics, part of the experience of the house. And by splitting the, the building, we could also achieve great flexibility of use because we could get a clear span if we went to steel that allowed uh, a belief that this could be reconfigured, reused in, in different ways. Now, this building has, um, it has a, a green wall for shading from the south. It has great daylight. It has a green roof on, a, on the part that's to your left, um, and it just achieved lead platinum. Uh, but what's most significant, again, about this building is that it was the first time that the Champlain College had done a building in 20 years that it hadn't, they hadn't had litigation about it. And in Vermont, uh, it's amazing to me that anything's ever built in Vermont because all it takes is 10 people, even if they live together, uh, all, if 10 people protest a project, it goes to land court and it's in litigation for years. And this project was one of the, it was the first time the college hadn't had litigation because of that, uh, uh, that attitude. So the college also, this field that you're looking at now, that's, a, that's deeded to the community. So it's a, an acre and a half that is public space in an area that's starting to become more institutional and that deeded space also serves as stormwater catchment. So there was a lot of integration here that made this a successful project. But the, the real success was how excited the community was about it and how excited the college has been about it and how excited the city of Burlington has been about it. Every project has opportunities. Every project has synergies. And you're always looking for those, I mean, does, the fun of design. The reason many of us want to be designers is it's, it's about taking you know, this problem and this problem and this problem and this problem, and they're all problems. And we, it's, it's sort of an overhack set thing to say that you have opportunities, but every problem is an opportunity. That's what design is all about. That's why it's so fun. So you, you draw these problems together and you're looking for solutions that are really synergies. So that building I showed you before, the EPA's building, it's the EPA's first green roof which is great. It's not visible very much from the street. And we were in that green roof. We were able to move the mechanical equipment up to the 16th floor so all the occupants looked down on a green roof, which is now quite dense, actually. This was right after it was installed. And we cut into the space of the green roof a skylight that drops down into one of the darker areas of the building, which is the new cafeteria for the EPA. So. So there are multiple solutions, but there are also multiple trade-offs. So the green roof is great. We know green roofs, we actually did a study that was funded by Mass Technology on whether this was a real energy saver for the building before we did the green roof. And we know that it has a synergy of, of energy savings because of, of the heat island effect, because of the air intakes that are close to it. But we also know that we had to move that mechanical equipment up to the 16th floor, which meant we had to pump more. So there's always this trade-off. It's never just a slam dunk in my experience. Uh, you know, if you're really brilliant, like I'm sure Bruce and Tom have never had these trade-offs. And Col they're going to talk to you in a few weeks, so you'll find out that what real brilliance can be as they, tr they go into design. Not to put you on the spot or anything. So 
We use daylighting a lot as a placemaking tool and an energy reduction tool. Historic buildings have great, often have great daylighting, particularly 19, before 1920. You know, the, the one thing I should address is that the myth of historic buildings being energy hogs is truly a myth. The, the data shows that a commercial building built before 1920 is actually, as a group, they're the best energy performances and energy per square foot until you get to this, this decade, this new surge in green building. So they tend to have great daylighting, they tend to have great natural ventilation. There, there, was a, there is a bleak period that, that uh, we weren't so good about energy, but that doesn't mean that every building can't have its energy performance improved. Now this is one of the many kinds of buildings that's just considered sort of a, a knockdown dog. It was just a big, flat, old institutional building at the University of Connecticut. They actually intended to knock it down. We said, wait a minute, let us do a study. We did a study. We looked at the idea that it could still be reused as labs, which was its intended purpose, and that we could improve the, the experience of the building. So we, we created a sort of network within the building, an organizational interior path that uses daylight to help you know where you are, brings you to a center place that becomes a community. Building community is a big thing for us in our design. And uh, so that, that became a way to reuse the building. Buildings like this offer tremendous before and afters, good for marketing, but also good for actually the campus because this is a lab building. Many of you might know lab buildings can be very expensive. This building was renovated for $230 a square foot. That's well below what you would spend in new construction, and it's well below what people expect to spend in uh, renovations. It actually just won uh, Renovated Lab of the Year, our second Renovated Lab of the Year. So we were very pleased. Now this is a building at the University of Virginia. It is a building at the very bottom of the lawn, wraps the Stanford White building that, that marks the end of the lawn. And uh, the side that looks towards Stanford White's building is actually sort of this weird 1950s schoolhouse vernacular. So working with their campus historian, we propose that this invisible side that's in an area way, that we actually open up the main stair and bring daylighting into the building. And then when you're in the building, not only in the stair can you now look at the, at the, at the McKim building, I mean the Stanford White building, but you now have a, a sort of place-making event. You know where you are in the building. It was very disorienting building because it had long corridors and it's very dark. This is a building at, at Harvard University. It's actually also, a, it's a McKim building, used to be their freshman union. We uh, cut, we put a skylight on the top of it, working with the Cambridge Historic Commission, added dormers that we found evidence of in the original drawings, and punched through the building so that we had a central stair. But most importantly, we, we dramatically increased the density of this building. So we used to joke as preservation architects that we really just worked on basements and attics. And uh, that's in a large part true because part of the efficiency of, of historic preservation and the opportunity in adaptive reuse is to increase the density inside to make every building more effective in how it's utilized. You know, this, this is not a, a simple issue. And we tend to think of it in very simple ways. And that's challenging. So this is my plug for cohabitation. You can take this back to your parents. If you don't reduce your footprint, your carbon footprint, by living by yourself or getting rid of your husband. For some reason, my husband doesn't like this slide. And I keep telling him that the point is that she should not nix Harold. Harold is actually a good thing. Harold shares all her resources. Harold shares her couch and her TV and her stove. And so as long as she lives with Harold, she uses less energy than if she nixes Harold. So. But this is a part we don't usually talk about in, in energy. And actually, this is something that, cold, that you're going to hear about, I think, in a couple of weeks, that the really cohabitation and density of occupancy is a very, very key issue. Building size, uh, housing size has gone up 30% in the last 20 years. Uh, we tend to tear down existing buildings in order to make new, bigger buildings that have fewer people in them. Now, I know this is a design audience, but because I've been questioned about this, every once in a while I show this slide and afterwards somebody comes up to me and goes, I really like that house in the middle. And so, I just want to make a point. The house in the middle is a bad house. <laughs> 
You are not supposed to like the house in the middle. So if you like the house in the middle, just keep it to yourself. And the reason that this is a bad house is because it clearly replaced an existing house which was much smaller. It uses more cars and it probably has fewer people living in it. So even if this is a brand new house that meets new energy codes, it probably uses more energy per person than the house on either side of it. And it used an exponentially larger amount of materials in order to make. And this is, a, this is something that we do routinely in our country. Uh, so we, we, this house might be actually classified as a new lead green house but nobody's talking about how much energy or materials it used per person. We have an infatuation with the idea that every building should be its own energy plant. I just don't get this. That is just, to me, the dumbest idea. And I actually wrote my undergraduate thesis a long time ago on the idea that, that being off the grid, if every single one of us was off the grid, that wasn't really an improvement because we really weren't working as a community and that we really need to think about things from a community basis. Once again, these houses are probably all way too big they all depend on cars. They're probably in an area that was supposed to be a wetlands that was scraped off. And I don't consider these to be a green development. However, this is an example on our government's site about energy efficiency. So I, I think we have to think very holistically about what's going on. Now some of the good news is that a lot of good stuff is happening. I don't know if it's going to keep on happening because of funding and politics, but the National Trust for Historic Preservation a few years ago founded the Preservation Green Lab in Seattle. And the Preservation Green Lab is working really hard with the city of Seattle for a new pilot idea of how we measure energy within buildings for outcome-based energy codes. And is really making a push at the idea that, that Codes should be a little bit more flexible, not as prescriptive, that we have to think more creatively about the scorecard that goes on every single building, and we also have to be more accountable. They're also working on, on district energy systems, and this is happening in many places in the country and the world. The idea, like a campus, that you share a highly efficient cogeneration plant that has 80% efficiency and pipe that to all the buildings. Now, you may supplement that with additional energy energy pieces on the building, but you're really thinking in a community-wide basis, not on an individual basis. And they're teaming that with a Main Street attitude that starts to lay these new facilities underneath Main Streets, and then as you revamp the Main Street, you can turn that into a smart street. You can create rain gardens, you can make it pedestrian friendly, you can make it bike friendly, and you can have your utilities going right down the middle, ready to stub out to the existing buildings whenever that individual building owner is ready for it. So this kind of, of regional thinking is very exciting from an energy point of view. Now, the, our, our formal preservation community, the Advisory Council for Historic Preservation that counsels the President and Congress is also moving on sustainability and offering guidelines that, that are targeted to federal buildings. Our park services, our National Park Services offering technical preservation guidance on how to make buildings greener. They have said to me totally offline that it's a new era for them under this current administration. They're finally getting to address some of these things publicly and that's very exciting. They're offering many guidelines that I really approve of, things that make sense about integrated strategies, about analyzing the condition, about extending service life. They're uh, offering many no-brainer things that you have to keep commissioning, you have to keep looking at it, you have to think holistically. But they're also offering some things that I, I find actually very troublesome within the preservation world. And we, in, as a preservation architect, even though a very, very, very small percentage of our building stock is actually designated historic. For instance, in New York City, um, only 3.2% of the buildings in New York City are protected. I don't think Ed Glazer knows that.
what would be a good way of going about getting some of the funding or something that would help just everyday ordinary people instead of businesses, schools, federal government, state government? Well, I don't, I don't know this area, but I do know certainly within New England, um, the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association is very active. Um, there are a lot of training programs that are going on. Within New York, uh, the preservation community is working very closely with NYSERDA to actually have trainings for homeowners. And there's a lot of data. If you go particularly to the National Trust website, it focuses a lot on houses and sort of the, the, the smart things you can do. In Boston, the Boston Preservation Alliance has been running smart energy workshops. So, you know, typically, and, and granted, houses are not my, uh, this is from reading. You know, typically the first thing you want is your attic insulation. If you're in a 200 or 300 year old house, you want to put it in in a way that's not going to cause damage to the historic structure. You want to do that anyway, but, but I'm just saying the older the, the building, the more important the building, the more precious you, you treat it. And you, you look at your lighting loads. You can usually go to your energy company for an energy audit and get guidance right away. Now you may get feedback from the energy company about policies that replace windows. That isn't, I, I don't want to make windows the, windows are a false, false um, point of contention. What windows symbolize to the preservation community is that if you replace a window, you're throwing away something that has long service life. If, if end use energy is your most important issue, what not replacing your window indicates is a complete disregard for the amount of operational energy. But you can, of course, put storms. When I moved into my house, 1920s, two family in Somerville, uh, the first thing we did was we put storms on. The second thing we did was we blew in a cellulite insulation. Um, the third thing we did was we went to the, to the gas company and, and through their program replaced our boiler. Um, the fourth thing we did was we put in, and actually I guess as part of this was we put in a, a, a thermostat, controllable thermostat, which unfortunately the instructions are in Spanish and I can't figure out how to use it. Even I even had a friend who speaks Spanish come over. So I just turn the energy down when I go, you know. It's a little old fashioned. I just turn the temperature down when I go and, and I turn it up when I come home and I turn it down at night. It works very well, even though it's programmable. So those are usually the things you look for. And those usually have very, very good payback right away. So, yes? Could you expand a little more on, uh, when you mentioned how um, this idea that houses should be their own, um, like self-sufficient power generators, and how we should be viewing this as a community. Could you expand a little more on your thoughts on that? And do you see um, this community-based solution and for energy generation in homes? Um, is it uh, would it be okay then to have like smart regional grids? Are you thinking of a national grid or a, a power generation where we all can pitch in or we all use rationally? Well. You know, certainly there are people who have been very smart about lowering the use in their house and, and uh, putting on solar panels and really making their own house a net zero energy house. And I certainly wouldn't object to that. Many of us can't afford that and there aren't always incentives for doing that financially. There is an interesting project happening in, uh, in uh, Boulder, Colorado called the Living City Block and they've just started the same program in Brooklyn, the Living City Block, and I think you can go to the web and look for Living City Block. And they're treating this idea that actually the regional energy be by urban block by urban block. Uh, in smaller towns, many of the towns are embracing it as their, for the town. And you know, really you have to think about what is the most efficient. Is it the most efficient or environmentally effective to have solar panels on every single roof? Nothing against solar panels, but what is their efficiency? You know, best case, their efficiency might be 60%, lower, higher, 40%. I'm looking at Tom, so 40%. 20%. 20%.
So if you put a solar panel on your house with a 12% total efficiency, uh, why is, that shouldn't be better than doing a cogeneration plant which has an 80% efficiency which can feed more buildings. So it does mean, this is, these are structural changes to our society and our energy grid and our energy system that are happening in little grassroots pockets around the country and, and, I, and around the world. So to me, and it also actually, I believe there's, a, there's papers that talk about this from a security point of view, that this in some ways removes us from the large potential blackouts that plagued us at different points in time. So there's actually sometimes an odd consensus between highly conservative and highly liberal people because it's a better strategy for the security of the United States energy systems. So there was a, yes, Joe. The uh, institutions like this take a lot of pride in constructing buildings that meet certain legal standards. I hear very little discussion about the use of an overall framework to track how well sustainability is being met by the institution as a whole, addressing an array of the things that you've talked about. Um, re reuse of materials when a structure is torn down. Uh, addressing the loss of embedded energy when uh, this building, for example, I saw this building built. People today are talking about tearing it down. There is no policy on how you reuse the material. Uh, those who work in systems ecology use an energy budget using energy to track what's going on in the system. Has there been an attempt to develop a, uh, an inventory, an accountability, accounting system for something as large as a university campus? Well, I, I, I Dennis and, and and Jim might speak to this better than I, but the, the AC STARS system is actually a campus-wide greening system, and LEED has actually, I believe, come out with a, a, a portfolio campus system, which we were actually looking at for the St. Elizabeth's campus in Washington. And do each of those give full weight to the replacement value of buildings? You know, perhaps not, but, but that is actually, there are a number of studies that have come out in the last couple of years uh, that really are trying to do a, a full life cycle assessment, which looks at every piece of a building and compares existing to new so that you understand the trade-offs. There's one in, in England called um, New Bricks for Mold that was done by a housing group that looked at the replacement impact versus renovation and found that that it was 60 to 70 carbon that it was 60 to 70 years before the carbon of new construction was actually offset by higher improved efficiency there were two studies done at MIT by grad students that that actually believe that it's higher they say 90 years before payback um, there was a study done by Canada Parks that uh, sort of found the same thing that used uh, Athena Materials uh, Institute for the life cycle assessment. There's a study going on right now with the National Trust that is looking at um, eight different types of buildings in eight different locations. They're using a Swiss company called Qantas to do the life cycle assessment. And, and what their question was is, is if there is an existing building, if it is renovated, uh, how does that compare to a new building and the environmental impacts of each? And not and they they bent over. The National Trust has actually bent. Some of us think too far backwards to not be considered biased towards building reuse, because they've taken new buildings and said that assume that every new building is 75 years of life, and they've assumed that all materials, just in order to get an equal playing field, they've said that all materials for the new buildings and the renovation come from within 500 miles, which of course we know isn't true. But the the point was just to have apples to apples as much as possible and actually what this, the National Trust is finding is that if you assume the same square footage the the carbon offset of the new construction even if it's net zero in energy use 
never recovers. So, so the environmental impact of a new building is actually never offset by uh, lower operation. So from a purely environmental standpoint, we would, you would, you could make the rationale that it's always better to reuse a building. But as Kate Benfield from the Sustainable Communities at the Natural uh, Resources Defense Council said, it isn't that the, the greenest building is not necessarily the existing building. The greenest building is the existing building that is in the right place, doing the right thing to create a sustainable community. So there has to be more consideration given to existing buildings and new construction as an environmentally uh, degrading activity, which if anything should make us make our new buildings with great humility because we want them to be there for the long time and be highly serviceable. So, so it isn't just about the environment, but from an environmental standpoint, not having new materials is always better, but you may have just killed your economics, you may have created an unsustainable community. So, Dennis. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Joe, don't tear this building down. Okay. Yes. Oh, and uh, you know, I should just point out it's after one. If people want to go, it doesn't insult us. You go, and I'm going to stay and talk to Max's class. So, okay. Two classes. One of the things that, that I've noticed in, in preservation is preservationists are commonly confronted with how shall we be restore or preserve or reuse this landmark building, school, hospital, that someone has replaced with a new one down the road. They receive funding from the GSA or some other governmental agency to build a new whatever it is down the road without any review process of the impact of that on historic resources or the environment. We now have a review process which says, shall we tear down the empty whatever it is? Or shall we um, get the Lady Society or someone to come and generate some kind of a new use for the thing? Yeah. Would it make more sense in the review process to insist that that new facility cannot, could not be built without considering those impacts? In other words, if you're going to build a new high school or a new um, EPA headquarters <coughs> or whatever it is, that you should at that point as an agency, have to do the, do the math. Well, actually, you do. I mean, uh, okay. it, no, no, school, the schools. Well, actually, for, for anything that receives federal money since 196, since the National Preservation Act in the 1964, 66, uh, you are required to go through a Section 106 process that evaluates whether the new construction has a negative impact on any historic resource uh, in the surrounding neighborhood. And that is the review. And, it, and it's part of the Environmental Protection Agency review. That's exactly my point, that in the Section 106 review, we are looking, we are always, and I'm in in the concept, always ask after the decision has been made to build a new one, after the new one is constructed, which did not, let's say, have any impact, there were no historic houses torn down, we're now asked to figure out what to do with the vacant. Yes, the section 106, though, starts at the beginning of the process, not after the decision. And yes, the, the, clearly there's always tension about moving a, sor a resource out. You know, we see this all the time. You've got an empty chapel up on the hill. You've got, uh, we, schools have been, the policies have not been favorable to historic schools. Often blamed, uh, you know, based on the structural issues and uh, the abatement issues of asbestos or PCBs. So, you know, I sometimes take the stance, and I've seen many communities do this, where you're really sometimes just trying to hold on to a building and wait for the right development opportunity for it. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the, the use should have stayed in that building. It actually might not be 
it might truly have become outdated in the way it was functioning or what it was trying to do or in how much space was needed. But you know, like there's an old granite jail in Salem. It was vacant for years. And they finally, in Salem, Massachusetts, and they finally actually are just redeveloping it as housing. It had to wait for the economy to catch up. And we see this a lot. Sometimes we really just have to have the guts to, to to wrap a building up and let it sit until we find the use. Actually, the St. Elizabeth campus is a bit like that. It's been vacant uh, for almost 15 years as it waits in the, in the struggle between whether it's a development opportunity or a federal opportunity. And I would like to see policies that were more favorable towards renovation use. I think it's really essential. And they happen, as you say, on every front when there was a whole period when the funding for both libraries and schools in the state of Massachusetts really favored new and made it very hard to use that money for reuse. And, I, and there's been real pressure on that. So, so this is always part of the conversation and pushing back and forth on, on things. Should we break and then go to the, the two classes are staying yeah, next? Right. Okay. Let's pause and thank you. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.